you are currently in room South, Side, or South C's GH for session bypass surgery, abusing content delivery networks with server side, flash, and DNS. These are your speakers, Mike Brooks and Matthew Bryant. Hello everyone and welcome. Uh, yeah, this is bypass surgery and we are your hosts. I'm Matthew Bryan. I'm a security consultant at Bishop Fox. I like to do a lot of web hacking stuff, more specifically. They say you're supposed to keep your public keys public, so I have my signal key up there. And if you're texting anybody else about zero days and they don't have that key, it's not me. So. And I'm Mike Brooks. I go by Rook, which is my last name without the BS. I'm uh, an avid participant in Stack Overflow and security.stackexchange. I like these communities, and I encourage other security professionals to participate. So the modern web today, you rarely have the situation where you have a company that hosts all of their own content on their web pages. You know, they make use of a lot of third-party services to deliver their product. And all of these things work invisibly in the background, kind of without your knowledge, when you visit these web pages. And of course, you know, more specifically, we're talking about content delivery networks. So these are networks that will serve content for other pages. You, know, you get to take advantage of their very fast distributed um, you know, web services. And when you visit a lot of your sites that you use every day, you trust all of these networks kind of implicitly. Because these companies use them, you actually extend your trust to them. So many people kind of think of the web like this. They think, you know, I type in foxnews.com in my web browser, hit enter. They think that the request goes to Fox, they return a web page, and that's the whole transaction. But of course, as we know, this is not the case. Fox News takes advantage of many third-party services to deliver this final product to you, their web page. They use things like Adobe Analytics, maybe, to take, to take you know, statistics of their current customer base, see how they're browsing the site. Maybe their actual web content itself is served by Akamai, a big CDN. And even stuff like DNS can be used with 9DNS, and they'll actually provide that for you. So you have all of these things coming together to deliver the final product today. It's not just all of Fox's own servers. So we're in an interesting position now. So we have all of these big websites on the internet, and we're trusting just a few CDNs with all of this. So we've kind of taken all of our eggs and we've put them in only a few baskets. So what happens when we have a vulnerability in one of these CDNs? As it turns out, the impact is severe and it's far-reaching. We have an example video. This is the raw Florin website. We have a user navigating the site as usual. And of course, RawFluin, like any other website, makes use of third-party services. And we notice that the user browses to a third-party page after they visited this website. And this is, this is our attacker payload. And after they visit this payload, they notice something odd has happened with the RawFluin site. In fact, when they continue navigating, they notice that something's been added to their shopping bag. And when they go to view that, they notice that a almost $30,000 handbag has been added into their cart without their knowledge. Um, this is an alligator drawstring bag. Very classy. <laughs> That's one expensive alligator. <laughs> so before I go on to this next proof of concept, I'd just like to give a little shout out. Um, we had Microsoft reach out to us ahead of time. They saw our talk and you know, emailed us and said, hey, are we vulnerable? So we were able to help them get things patched up before this. So what you're about to see no longer works because they were proactive, actually, with their you know, incident response. So this proof of concept here, we have a user going to an, a URL at live.com. So this is Microsoft's official website. And they see a page that says, protect your PC, which appears to serve Microsoft security essentials which is, on, is you know, expected for Microsoft. But when they actually go down to actually install that software, they get command.exe instead. Now, how is this possible? Why is Microsoft serving this random file? And the answer is a vulnerability that we found. So what happened here? Um, we used an attack chain uh, using server-side request forgery and a remote Swift include. Now, why is attack chaining useful? Attack chaining is useful because it allows us to expand the impact and affect more people. Um, as a real-world example, um, let's say you want to break into a house. First, you go and you, uh, the gate to their uh, backyard is open, and then in the backyard you find a ladder. And that ladder, you get to the second floor balcony, and then the, the window is open. Now, that is attack chain to break into a house. Now, how do you break into an ivory tower? Well, you use an ivory ladder. Those poor elephants, poor elephants. 
So the first step in our attack is reconnaissance. Now DNS holds all the keys. It shows us important trust relationships for our target. And, um, and, and that was the first step in this attack. So this particular vulnerability uh, that we're talking about has been around for a while. And one of the reasons why I think it has gone undiscovered this long is because of scoping problems in, pe in penetration tests. Usually in a penetration test, we're concerned about the internal infrastructure. We're worried about their load balancer, internal HTTP servers, databases, administrative interfaces. But external supporting services are often let it left out of scope. Um, this can include Gmail, you know, VoIP services, uh, CDN, and cloud services. So really, this vulnerability affects the supporting infrastructure in the system. So how do we find, how do we map out the supporting infrastructure for our target? Um, there are a number of DNS tools out there. Uh, a good one is DNS Dumpster. However, DNS Dumpster has an artificial limitation of only 256 DNS records. 256 records is very small. Now that might work just fine for a mom and pop website, but it's not gonna help for the Alexa Top 1000. There are also brute force tools such as Fierce or DNS Recon. Now these are more, old, these are older tools, and I, I think they're flawed. So I wrote a tool, Subbrute, and we'll talk a bit about that. So I'm the project maintainer for Subbrute, and we have about 80 forks on GitHub. I take GPL very seriously. So I go through forks of my project, and I see how they've modified my tool, and I try to add these cool features into the mainline. And the usage is simple. Uh, the most thorough scan would be running subroot, in this case against google.com. The best dash p switch gives you uh, uh, information about the records, or actually prints out all of the records instead of just the subdomains. And dash s is uh, the, the subdomain list to use. Uh, there's also a very fast option. If you use dash r, it uses open resolvers as a kind of proxy to access the server. Dash r is pseudo anonymous in that none of your uh, traffic from your system goes directly to your target. It all goes through intermediaries, which helps protect your identity. So Subroot is a meta-query spider. So what is a meta-query? So AXFR is a meta-query type, and it is a transfer, uh, transfer zone. If AXFRs are supported by your target, then it's the easy button. You get every DNS record. Um, but as you may expect, it's disabled on the vast majority of websites, something like 99%. So after AXFRs fail against every authoritative server, it'll fall back on the any meta-query type. Now any meta-queries return all records for that given name. If you're going through a open resolver and that open resolver doesn't have any records for, uh, for that name, the record's passed on to the authoritative. So what is an any query? Uh, well, you can run an any query with dig on the command line. So this is an example of running dig any google.com against 8.8.8.8. .8 this referred 24 records, all different types. So if you do an a record, a query, you'll just get a records in response. Meta queries return a variety of records in response. So in this case, we get a, quadruple a, ns, and even strange records like type 257. What is type 257? Oh. Uh, now, what Subroot does is it takes uh, the, this response and uses a regular expression to match all subdomains. Now, Subroot is, it doesn't care what the record types are. It's future proof. It just cares what the data is. It matches subdomains. After it matches these domains, it recursively crawls them to find new, new records. Now, what does this give us? When we run it against google.com, we get over 3,000 records in response. Now, as far as I know, there is no other open source tool that can get anywhere near this number of records on Google. And I think that's sad. We need better DNS tools, we need improvements to subroot, and we need more records from Google. And because we're able to get this kind of insight into our targets, that's how we found this vulnerability to begin with. If we have better DNS tools, I think we'll find more vulnerabilities like this. So a bit of interesting, uh, uh, so Google overwhelmingly has A records. Now that's not true for all targets. Google is, is specific. They're the number one website in the world and they don't use any other supporting infrastructure. They use their own content delivery systems, they use their own email infrastructure, their own VoIP infrastructure. Now there are other record types returned here. SRV records, uh, no error, what is this? So type 257 is a SHA-1 fingerprint of the issuing CA cert. It is a way to prevent malicious CAs from issuing certificates for Google services. And it is an emerging standard. Now, uh, type 257, uh, the reason why Google has a type 257 record is because they're running into trouble with malicious governments that are issuing uh, 
uh, certificates that they should not be. So not only does DNS show us trust relationships, it shows that our target doesn't trust people, and that's important. Now, there's another emerging standard, Dane. DNS-based authentication of named entities. This is a system of public key distribution based on DNSSEC. Um, all browsers have Dane hooks built into them to switch over to Dane at any time, but it's currently disabled. Also, DNSSEC has not been widely deployed. In the future, I hope that this problem of malicious CAs will go away entirely, and I think Dane may be the answer to that, but we're not in that future. So SRV records. There are about 22 SRV records returned on Google. What is an SRV record? Well, SRV records follow a common pattern. The first subdomain, in this case, underscore TCP, is the transport layer. As you might imagine, there are other transport layers uh, defined, underscore TLS, underscore UDP. And then the, uh, underneath that, in this case, CalDAV. That is the actual service being run. So CalDAV is running on port 80 and is pointing to calendar.google.com. The next service is a Jabber client, and this is running on port 5222 and is pointing to the, uh, a, Google, a Google service. There's also LDAP here. Now, in a Windows environment, the LDAP server is the domain controller. They're one and the same. We can see it's running on port 389, and it can be found at ldap.google.com. Now, when we were running this service against our target, we enumerated CNAME records. And the CNAME records showed that um, some of our target's subdomains were pointing to Edge Suite. Um, now, Edge Suite uh, then pointed to an Akamai service, and then finally uh, pointed by, by a CNAME to Akamai service, and then finally an A record to an Akamai server. So in this case, one of these subdomains, uh, both in our target and in this case Facebook, um, were ultimately pointing to a vulnerable service. Now, when we saw that both our target were affected and Facebook was affected, we realized that this issue affected everyone. So, Subroot also can be run on internal network assessments or via post-exploitation. So, and that's why I built the .exe, because if you're in a Windows environment. So, if you run it uh, against the, an internal network, you'll get different, uh, different results. Uh, internal services, such as, uh, such as LDAP, will be found. I mean, how does a Windows system identify its domain controller? It uses service records. How do VoIP phones know where its VoIP gateway are? Service records. So, in this case, we ran this on a real internal assessment, and we found 19 domain controllers for the system. That's a big network. Each domain controller was named after a hockey team. Rangers, Sharks, Chinooks. Um, and how much do you want to bet that one of their passwords was a hockey player name followed by the uniform number? The chances were good. <laughs> Um, now, there's also common misconfigurations in DNS. So, CWE203 is information disclosure through discrepancy. This is the common weakness, the catch-all for side-channel uh, side attacks. So, yes, DNS can also suffer from side-channel attacks. What does that look like? So, what Subroot will do is first tries to look up a domain that it doesn't exist. It's some UUID as a subdomain. And it records the, re the, the response. So, for most servers, it'll be NX domain, which is effectively no record fact. But it could be anything. It could be no error. It could be uh, refused. Now, as it's going through the process of enumerating other records, it keeps track of the response received. And if it receives a different response, then there's something going on here. It's like when I'm going to the, domain, uh, when I'm going to the, the DNS server and say, hey, does underscore domain key.legitbank.com exist? And as the server, I would say, you know, I can't confirm or deny the existence of any of these records, but you didn't throw an error when you did that query. So, hmm, something suspicious here. Okay. Um, so, underscore domain key, internal, dev, these may be interesting targets. Um, let's map them out. So, subroot takes its output files as input files, and it also are, is a greppable format. So, we can cat out the results, grep for no error for these strange records, and then run subroot on these strange records. So what did we find? SCI is its own domain underneath legitbank.com. Now, SCI has its own domain controller found at ldap.sci.legitbank.com. Uh, and when we resolve the CNAME chain, we get down to an IP address that's on an internal network. This is from the, an external uh, attacker. We can find the IP address of the internal domain controller. That should not happen. That is an information disclosure vulnerability. But what else can we find? So internal, now internal.legitbank.com, this has, uh, this definitely sounds interesting. Now accounting.internal.legitbank.com, that would be something we would want to access. 
So how do we access this service? Server-side request for tree. SSRF is about trust. Your server, your target, legitbank.com, needs to trust a variety of services. It may uh, trust, uh, it may be in a virtual private cloud environment where there are uh, various cloud services that it depends upon. There may be internal web services, internal APIs, or internal databases and internal administrative interfaces, all which trust legitbank.com and would not be normally accessible. Now why does SSRF exist? So one of the reasons, one of the ways that SSRF is introduced into an application is via a cross-domain proxy. So the same origin policy may prevent a developer from loading in, sor uh, loading in resources needed to render the page. And they may rely on a cross-domain proxy to, fulfill the, to uh, bypass the same origin policy intentionally. So when I search for cross-domain proxy on Google, the first two hits are SSRF. Now, an intentional bypass to a security system can turn into a valuable link in an attack chain. So what tools do we use for SSRF? So there's NCAT, which is the latest version of NetCat, and I recommend updating. Many people are still using the old NetCat. There's also a free service, httpbin.org, but personally, I don't use httpbin for my pen tests, and the reason why is because I want to keep my ODAs private. I don't want a third party to have this information. So I prefer Burp Collaborator. Now Burp Collaborator is a new uh, feature of Burp in which you're running a server on your own infrastructure. And this server can accept callbacks from your target. This is very useful in not only side channel attacks but also SSRF exploitation. So let's go back to one of the results from Google was PHP cross-domain proxy. Now this came up on a pen test where proxy.php was running on our target and it accepts one parameter, csurl. Now when we pass csurl localhost 631, we gained access to the cup statement. Now the cup statement runs as root and is only accessible on localhost. What this shows is that SSRF was allow us to break a trust boundary and access a localhost system. Now older versions of cups were vulnerable to shell shock and was exploitable using SSRF, which would let you remote root on the system. Unfortunately, cups 153 was not vulnerable to shell shock and that did not give us a shell on this assessment. So, what I did was is I used Burp uh, Intruder in cluster bomb mode. Now, cluster bomb, what it does is, in this case, we have two insertion points, and we give it two lists, and it tries every combination of those two lists. So this is useful if you're brute forcing usernames and passwords for a login form, or in this case, turning SSRF into a local a port scanner for the local network. So. Uh, we scanned the internal network and we found that 192.168.201.1 on port 80 returned to 200 OK. When we visit the site, we found that it was a Cisco switch and it had a default username and password, an all too common finding on an internal network assessment. Now what else can we do? So legitbank.com is running a uh, load balancer. Now this load balancer specifically was an Nginx pass-through proxy. And it was routing based on hostname and path to internal services. So when you gave it www.legitbank.com, you accessed a, uh, one of the HTTP servers hosting this application. So what about accounting.internal.legitbank.com? Well, using Burp Repeater, we established an HTTPS connection to legitbank.com, a publicly resolvable IP address. Then we changed the host to accounting.internal.legitbank.com, and lo and behold, it gave us access. Now this particular uh, endpoint was a RESTful web service with a trivial username and password. On its internal network, it was segregated from the other systems, and uh, they were not expecting it to be exposed remotely. Um, literally, this service allowed us to move funds between accounts and allowed us to rob the bank blind. So yes, how many people are looking for SSRF in load balancers? Well, you should start. So some questions to ask yourself in SSRF exploitation. The root, of, the root question is, can I access a protected resource? Another question, can you turn another vulnerability into SSRF? For example, XXE or XML entity, uh, external entities, can be turned into SSRF by defining a DTD system to make HTTP requests. You may be able to make HTTP requests to the internal network and map out the system or access protected resources. Um, can you identify in 
internal hosts, internal IP addresses using subroot? And can you access those using uh, this vulnerability? Can you access a virtual private cloud? Can you access S3 or MongoDB? By default, MongoDB doesn't have a password. And you may be able to access uh, collections that are not intended. Um, can you also, uh, also, can you access a host that you control? Can you have a connect back to Netcat? Or um, the HTTP client uh, may be setting uh, an authorization bearer token in the header. Or that client may be vulnerable to something like Heartbleed. Um, you're connecting to an HTTP client, and now that client could be exploited potentially. But another question, can I load arbitrary content, such as a malicious SWIFT on a remote domain? So with that handoff, we're going to move from SSRF, and we're going to talk about SWIFT include vulnerabilities. So Flash is an interesting bed for exploitation because of the way that when a Flash application executes, its origin is actually in the site that hosts it, which is different from things like JavaScript. Before we go into this, though, I want to give you guys a few tools. So when you want to go out and do this, you can use these to um, you know, find vulnerabilities, make proof of concepts. One of them is the cross-domain XML proof of concept tool. This is a Flash application which allows you to do cross-origin requests in Flash. You can type in URL parameters and it will tell you did that request work, was there a security error, and so you can debug these cross-site requests with Flash. If you don't want to write action script in your proof of concept, which I never want to do, you can use Flash HTTP request, which is a bridge with Flash where you, that you can call from JavaScript. So you can make all of your POCs in JavaScript without touching any action script at all. Another good tool that was recommended to me by Mike was JPEX. And JPEX is great when it comes to decompiling SWIFTs in these Flash applications. It gives you the full source code. And in addition, you can also modify the source code and you know, compile it on the fly. So it's very useful for finding Flash exploits. Another great tool is, that was made by some of our colleagues is Search Diggity. So if you have a vulnerable SWIFT, you can enumerate the endpoints on different services using search engines. And so you can kind of take this and figure out who's affected by this vulnerable SWIFT. Yeah, in 2015, search engine hacking is still alive and well with Search Diggity. I recommend checking it out. Great. So we're going to, in order to kind of give you an idea of why Flash is weird with how it works, we're going to compare it to JavaScript in when you include it on, a, on your own web page. So, but before we go into that, let's touch on what's an origin. So origins at a core are actually quite simple. They're just a combination of port, scheme, and domain. And you know, why do we have these things on the web? The reason is, if you had my, for example, my blog opened up in a tab, and you open a new tab, and you go and you check your Gmail, should my blog be able to reach into that and start reading your emails? The answer is, of course, no. And the web doesn't allow you to do this. And the reason why is they both have separate origins. And you can't do cross-origin requests on the web because that's a same origin policy violation. So these are kind of the critical, it's kind of a critical component of web security today. Same origin policy protects us from all of these web attacks. So the differences between JavaScript and Flash, they're actually pretty much the opposite in the way that they execute. So when you have, a, for an example, an external script tag on your page and you source a piece of JavaScript from a third-party domain, when that JavaScript runs on your page, it executes in the context of that page, not the site that hosts the JavaScript, but on the, on the domain that loaded it. And Flash completely turns this on its head. It's completely the opposite. So with Flash, I may embed a Swift on my own page, but when it executes, it's not executing in the context of that page. It's actually execu executing in the context of that third party domain. So to drive this point home, we have some examples. Here is an example HTML page, and it sources JavaScript from thirdparty.com. This is on you know, the homepage of legitbank.com. And all this JavaScript has in it is a simple snippet that simply prints the current executing origin. So it shows you know, what, what am I currently executing as. And so we, we, of course, open this in a web browser. What do we see? It's executing in the context of legitbank.com, not of the third party that hosted it. Flash turns this on its head. Now, we have a Swift that we're embedding from thirdparty.com on legitbank.com. Now, in order to show that this is executing in the context of third party, we have a secrets.txt file that we've hosted on this site. So now, we've got a short little video here. And we use the cross-domain proof of concept tool we talked about earlier. And we enter in the URL for this secrets.txt file that's hosted on this third party. And of course, when we actually go to make this request, this is perfectly fine. Because 
this Flash application is executing in the context of third party, not of legit bank. So that succeeds just fine. Now, when we go off to do this request to legitbank.com, despite it being embedded in that page, it doesn't work because the Swift is not loaded in the context of legitbank.com. It's of the third party. So this is the difference between the two. And this is why Flash is so interesting for exploitation when you do hijacking of Swifts. So Flash also has, if you want to allow cross-origin requests, Flash is a way for you to do that. They have something called crossdomain.xml. And this is a simple XML document that you put in your web root and you specify a list of sites that are allowed to do a cross-origin request to your site. It's kind of like a bouncer list. You know, I trust these sites. They can grab stuff from my website. You know, they're all good. And unfortunately, wildcard usage is incredibly commonplace in this space. And I'm not sure if this is due to misunderstanding of how these policies work or just, you know, an effort to get things to work correctly. So we have an example cross-domain policy on legitbank.com. Now, you'll look at this initially and you'll say, oh, well, there's only two entries. So there's not a lot of surface area for us to attack as hackers. And that's not the case. This is a very, very wide open cross-domain XML policy. Any subdomain of either legitbank.com or thirdparty.com, if, if it has a, a SWIFT that an attacker has created on it, we can compromise the security of the main website. So this could be potentially thousands of subdomains and we only have to compromise just one to compromise the security of the base legitbank.com. And many people make up statistics, but we've actually looked into this. We pulled the Alexa top 10,000 and we pulled all of their cross domain files and the ones that had it, we checked, do they do this subdomain wildcarding? And we found after taking all of this data that 75% of them do. And that's scary to think about. So 75% of the Alexa top 10,000 sites that use cross domains are exposing this massive surface area. And we'll see how this comes back to bite us when we combine it with other exploits. So if you're an attacker and you're looking at that cross domain and you say, you know, I want to be in this, in this whitelist. I want to perform an attack here. So how would you do that? The answer is with, of course, subroot. So you can use subroot to enumerate the subdomains of both you know, thirdparty.com and legitbank.com. And you can find all of these endpoints and try to get your malicious SWIFT on them. And so if you have a malicious SWIFT on any of these subdomains, you've compromised the security of legitbank.com. So I talked about hijacking SWIFTs. What does that mean? So one example of a Flash application that we found is a product called FlowPlayer. What is FlowPlayer? It's a Flash application that plays videos. And it's got some unique functionality to it, which allows you to load plugins to kind of customize the functionality, the feeling of the player. So if you want to you know, blend in with your rest of your site layout, you can do that by making Flash plugins for the player. Unfortunately, versions of FlowPlayer below this 3.2.16 version allow the loading of arbitrary Swifts from any domain. And this is incredibly problematic because what this allows us to do as attackers is embed this Swift on our page, specify an arbitrary plugin, and we can load that into the Swift and hijack all the functionality of the player. Now, this is a bad deal because as I talked about before, this Swift is loading in the context of whatever party that's hosting it. So if, the, if a domain has this on their site, it can go very, very wrong. Here's just an example. You embed the Swift on your page and you kind of declare it with JavaScript like this. So you say, I, you know, I have a plugin, simple hello world, and I want to load this arbitrary Swift from this domain. So FlowPlayer at one point realized this is a really bad deal. We need to fix this. So they released a new version, 3.2.18, and they added a bunch of functionality to check all of these, you know, plugin URLs that people provide when loading this player. And the idea was to make sure that they were either the same domain as the player or that they were trusted so attackers couldn't just willy-nilly hijack it. So this code, what it does is it parses the URL of the plugin. And the prob problematically with that is when you parse URLs, it's actually quite a hard thing to do. Many people think of it as trivial, but in fact that's not the case. And we actually have an interesting story that goes with this. Are we there yet to talk about Oh, we'll just, just go, we'll go for it. Um, okay. So uh, when we were hacking this uh, Flow Player, I found the code that was checking uh, the origin of the plugin. And, um, well, actually, I don't think we're there yet. Anyway. Um, uh, Tangled, well, yeah, I was, I was checking the code and I had read, I'd read this book, uh, Tangled Web. And Tangled Web has a whole chapter devoted to 
just how URLs are parsed. And I'm like, there is likely a bug here. And sure enough, uh, we found not one, but multiple bugs. So I found one issue, and I was like, yeah, this is, this is a great bypass. And so I sent a link to the code over to my friend here. And uh, I'm like, hey, can you find the bypass? And uh, he's, he, he came back within like maybe 15 minutes and said, like, yeah, I found the bypass. And I'm like, no, that's, that's a new bypass. That, I did not find that one. That one's different. <laughs> so the first bypass. All right, so we found many bypasses. Uh, we're just going to talk about three today. So this first bypass here, if you all look up at this code, you could probably see a few issues with it. This is in the code that checks the uh, plugin URL, and it says, you know, is this you know, a local to this user system? If it is, we can assume that it's trusted. Go ahead and load it. Now, there's, you could probably see a few here, but we're going to highlight this one. And what this check does is it says, if the plugin URL, if the first character is a forward slash, then we assume it's trusted, it's local. Uh, this is, of course, problematic because on the web you can do this, you can do a double forward slash to denote this, it's a special type of URL and how this works is whatever, you know, if it was loaded over HTTP, this plugin will be loaded as HTTP, HTTPS, so it kind of inherits whatever the page's, you know, protocol is using. So we, with just two forward slashes, we bypassed all of the security that they've added into this new version and we can load any arbitrary plugin that we want to hijack this SWIFT. The second check, and this is one that was found by Mike. Uh, so this check here is it's trying to find the, the beginning of the scheme and where the domain starts. Um, so the vulnerability is in this line here. It believes the beginning of the scheme is three forward slashes. So we can fool this check by um, having our attacker.com domain and then three forward slashes and then the target that we want to attack, in this case legitbank.com, and then a dot dot slash to remove it. Um, in this case, the code thinks that uh, attacker.com is a part of the scheme and it doesn't uh, take into consideration that maybe, uh, maybe it's not. <laughs> so uh, another bypass is more, uh, more general purpose. So if there's an open redirect on, the, on your target, uh, then you could use an open redirect to fool the origin check and to load in your Swift from a remote host. Now, open redirects are typically a low-risk vulnerability, and in this case, we're turning this low-risk vulnerability into something high-risk, a full uh, origin uh, bypass. So as we said before, there are many more bypasses. I'm sure if you took some time and went through the code, you could probably find some of your own. We're only going to talk about three today because... Yeah, three is a good number. Another thing I'd like to add, we talked to Flowplayer about this issue and they basically told us, well, Flash is dead and we're not fixing these issues. So if you ever see a flowplayer.swift on an engagement, it's a problem. It's always a vulnerability. So what does this mean for us as attackers? What this means is if anybody has any version of this full player on this website, we can hijack that SWIFT and perform some very interesting attack scenarios. So what does that look like? We have an example flow here as if we were an attacker trying to attack our victim. And we have them logging into legitbank.com. So they're going to manage their finances, go about their day. And sometime after they've logged in, they navigate to our attacker page. And once they do this, our attacker page loads this SWIFT, this vulnerable flow player, from legitbank.com. And once we load this SWIFT, we will then have it on our page and we use that JavaScript to declare our arbitrary plugin. Now what's great about this is we've now hijacked all the functionality of the SWIFT and it's still executing in the context of legitbank.com. So what can we do now? We can go right back to Legit Bank and you know, grab users' banking information. We can send you know, money to my friend in Nigeria using their account. And we can do all of this perfectly fine. It's not a same origin policy violation because this SWIFT is still executing as if it was from LegitBank.com. And these are the kind of exploits that come about when you do SWIFT hijacking. So we're going to move on to hacking websites with Akamai's Edge Suite. But what is Edge Suite? So Edge Suite is a server used in Akamai's content delivery service and it's part of the free flow system. So the setup process for this involves you will take a subdomain or your domain and you will make a CNAME record into Akamai's network. So now when people hit this domain, they don't hit your website, you know, they hit Akamai's network and, they, and that, uh, that network serves the content. And this affords you some nice things, you know, use your site loads faster because you get to take of their diverse network, you know, geographically um, distributed across the world. And so it looks like this in DNS. So we have akamai.example.com that is cnamed to example.com.edgesuite.net, which is another cname into akamai.net. And we have the IP address of an Akamai server. 
So why would people do this? So we have an example flow here, which is a user who wants an HD image of a cat, which is kind of my view of internet traffic at large. So you know, they go off and they go to you know, akamai.example.com and they ask them, you know, I'd like this image. This server will go on to example.com server and will say, hey, this user is looking for an image of a cat, could I have it? That will return the feline to Akamai. And that will be returned back to the end user. You know, notice this is kind of an extra hop. Why do they do this? And the reason is, next time if anybody comes along and they're looking for the same image of a cat, you know, Akamai will just serve it back without asking. So you save all of these extra hits to your own service and save bandwidth, and you, know, you, you get the speed that comes along with Akamai's distributed network. So Akamai has a unique piece of functionality called Akamai Resource Locators. Um, they're often abbreviated in documentation as ARLs. And what are these? These are special URLs that Akamai used to use way back in the day. And how these work is, I would like to mention first that they're a, a deprecated system. They're not widely used today. But what they did is you could construct the special URL at one of Akamai's endpoints and you would specify a resource in it. And then that, the Akamai would go off, grab that file, and host it on their network. But despite this being you know, deprecated, it's actually enabled on many endpoints today, as we're going to show. So how does this work? We have an example, Swift, here, and we want to load it onto Akamai's network. And we want to do this via ARL v1s. So we construct this URL, and you can see here we have an endpoint of Akamai, and we have a few forward slashes as kind of a RESTful thing, and we, we pass different options to Akamai. We say, you know, what's my client ID for Akamai? How long do you, should this thing be storing the content? How often should it check back to see if anything's changed? And you'll notice we have this URL in it as well. So remember Mike mentioned in SSRF, this is kind of what you would see. You would see you know, an arbitrary URL being specified to a web page, and you know, they would go off and grab that content and return it to you. So this is kind of the same flow as SSRF. I wonder if there's any vulnerabilities here. So this process is known as Akamization, and it works as I described to you before. You know, user will visit this URL, Akamai will go off and it will grab that from this, you know, from a server and return it to you in the web page with all invisibly without you knowing. So if you point akamai.example.com using FreeFlow to this to Akamai service, we can host arbitrary files on your server. Well, not quite. So when we went about doing this, we encountered some initial problems. One of these things is, and we have an example Akamai endpoint right here. And we attempt to grab Google's robot.txt file and kind of load it through this site in an SSRF sort of way. And when we do this, we get an access denied message. So why are we getting that? What, is there some sort of whitelist that we have to be in? You know, how can we get around this? We want our content to be loaded. And so the way we went about this is we took to enumerating you know, what sites are in this whitelist. And of course, how did we do this? We took edgesuite.net and we started using subroot to find all of these subdomains. We combined some Google dorking with it and we came up with this we came up with an actual site that was in this whitelist. This is the site that we found. I'm kind of feeling a realization of what's about to come. So this is a, a server by Akamai, and it hosts all the versions of FlowPlayer for backwards compatibility, including that 3.2.16 version, which allows you to load any plugin, you know, from any arbitrary endpoint. So what does this mean for us? So not only do they host all the vulnerable versions of FlowPlayer, but now we can, you know, use these ARLs to force a Swift to be loaded on somebody's website, and not just a Swift, a vulnerable Swift. So we can, you know, kind of bring our attack, attack, chain, attack chain together here. So here's an example ARL v1. We have i.legitbank.com, which is mapped to this free flow service. And you know, we specify these forward slash parameters, and we specify the SWIFT, the 3.2.16 vulnerable version of FlowPlayer. And of course, when you visit this in your web browser, you just see this vulnerable SWIFT being hosted on this person's you know, website. So what this means for us is, if they have any endpoint that is using this free flow service with these ARLs enabled, we can make them vulnerable. We can actually introduce a SWIFT that we can then hijack into their environment. So this is kind of a long flow. We're going to bring it all together here and show you guys what an example attack scenario looks like. We have the user logging into legitbank.com. And after they do this, they navigate to our attacker page. What does our attacker page do? They use the ARL that I showed you before to load this Swift onto their page. And Akamai in the background, it sees the special URL, it parses it out, it goes off to media PM, grabs a Swift, and returns it as if the site was hosting it itself. So once we've loaded the Swift onto our page, 
we can, of course, hijack it. And now this SWIFT is executing in the context of this legit bank subdomain, in this case, akamai.legitbank.com. And remember what I told you guys about before with cross-domain files is they often do this, you know, all subdomains of mine are trusted via wildcards. So what this turns into is we can use this hijack SWIFT as a bridge to talk to legitbank.com and compromise all of their security. So now if a user is logged in, you know, we can dump all their financial information, you know, send money, do whatever we want, unrestricted, because we are trusted by this cross-domain file. So let's talk a bit more about this. I talked about cross-domain.xml policies before. Let's see how this turns out. So remember I talked before, we had two entries, but it exposes a massive attack surface. So what this means for us now is if any subdomain of these two domains points to one vulnerable endpoint of Akamai, what this means is their entire security is compromised. And this brings in another, something else that's quite interesting. You don't even have to be using this vulnerable endpoint. You don't even have to be using Akamai. You may have never even heard of Akamai. But you might be trusting them via your cross-domain.xml policy. And because of this, all of your security is now compromised. So we see what happens when we do this wild, wild card of trust, when we expand our attack service so greatly, we open ourselves up to attacks like this. So, you know, who made this mistake? Was this widespread? Did a lot of people, you know, have these cross-domain policies? So one example that we're going to show, and I, would, I just want to point out too, all the videos that we show here have been patched, so you can't go out and exploit them. This is for Verizon Wireless. So, you know, this is the, specifically the Verizon Wireless business site. And what this has here is we have, you know, a casual user, perhaps it's a business owner who wants to check on his employee's usage. He goes and he logs into this Verizon business website. And you know, he's you know, kind of unaware that in the background, what Verizon is doing is they have one of these cross-domain policies. And what do they do in that cross-domain policy? They do a wildcard of all subdomains of Verizon, you know, Verizon business. And so they have this massive service area exposed. So how could that be problematic? Well, as it turns out, one of those endpoints, of course, was mapped to this vulnerable Akamai endpoint. And now, when they navigate to a third-party site, you can see that we can, of course, load that SWIFT from that endpoint. We can use that SWIFT to make requests to the Verizon website. In this example, we're going to dump out all the phone numbers of this person's account. We're going to dump out all the SIM information for each device that they have on their account. And we can do any action as the currently logged in user. So they're completely under our control now. And this is all because they made this mistake of doing this wild card of trust. Do we have any NoScript users in the crowd? And don't lie to me, because this is Black Hat. <laughs> yeah, a couple. All right. So one of the things that people don't realize about NoScript is it actually ships with a very wide whitelist. So there are actually many entries that are automatically allowed to bypass NoScript. And it's not, they have many, and it's the same way as crossdomain.xml policies. So they'll have things like you know, google.com. And what that really means is all subdomains of google.com as well. So this comes back to bite us. Now, we have an example proof of concept video here. We just have a casual user who's trying out NoScript. You know, they get it from the official addons.mozilla website. We're not going to make any modifications to changes. This is a, you know, off-the-shelf install. And of course, when they do so, you can see NoScript immediately goes to work, blocks all active content as it should. You know, we try to navigate to the Adobe Flash player test site, and it blocks, you know, Flash as expected, and all of this active content is forbidden from running. Now, this is perfect. This is what the, you know, add-on is supposed to do. This is why it's so useful to people who want to, you know, be safe from web exploits. But when we navigate to an endpoint that's mapped to Akamai, that's also on the whitelist, we bypass all of NoScript. So all the protection that you originally had is completely gone. So even if you had no script and you were trying to prevent these exactly the type of exploits we're talking about, it doesn't matter because we're actually already in your whitelist and you already trust us if you haven't you know, dumped your whitelist when you installed the plugin. There are some other interesting bypasses that this affords us. So HTTP content security policy is kind of a, this, this awesome way to prevent you know, inline script injection. It's been preached as you know, once we have this, it's going to solve a lot of security problems. XSS will be incredibly hard to do. But you know, in this attack scenario, we're of course not injecting anything into their page. We're actually loading the Swift onto our own page and then hijacking it. So there's no CSP on my own page. We're just loading the resource into it. So CSP does not apply to us in this case. We go completely around all of that protection. And additionally, many, many sites make the mistake of you know, the whitelist in their CSP. They say, OK, sources from you know, the CDN or this you know, Google API's uh, service that I use, they're all trusted. We can do that. And of course, that's problematic because when we have a vulnerability in this CDN, we can actually bypass all of this protection. 
So I'm sure, I hope I've kind of made a good impact on you guys. You, if you are using Akamai, you're kind of wondering to yourself, how do I get fixed? You know, this is, this is very worrying to me. I want to make sure that I'm protected. So in order to address this vulnerability, they've actually, we've worked with them and they've been very helpful. I'm sure all of you know what it's like to you know, reach out to a vendor and have them not help you, but this is not the case here. They came out, you know, they wanted to know everything about it, get things fixed as quickly as possible. So in fact, you may actually already be patched. Akamai's been rolling out these, yeah. these patches that have... In fact, a patch was rolled out this morning, kind of. Uh, so many people are already fixed, but not everyone. Uh, not everyone can be fixed because if they were to roll out a patch, um, it may cause disruptions. So. Yeah, so what Mike is referring to is if you actually do make use of ARLs, this kind of older style, um, you, you know, you, you may have to have this functionality running. And Akamai does have, you know, stuff in place to help you out in that situation as well. So if, you, if you're, you know, incredibly worried and you still want to phone up Akamai, their support agents actually have a playbook that they can read through. And so, um, you know, they actually are probably going to reach out to you proactively. But if you don't want to wait, so you can call them at this support number that I have on this slide here. Or you can email them at this cccare at akamai.com. Now, if you have public inquiries about this vulnerability, you want to say, you know, what's up, back am I? You know, can you explain a little bit more about this? They should have a statement out today to you guys. And all public queries can be, you know, directed to Rob Morton. And that's his, you know, number and his email. I would also like to make note that if you're a security researcher like us and you have a vulnerability in their platform or you know, any part of their service, they, they want you to reach out. They really want people to help them out. They're not going to turn you away if you have a vulnerability. They actually want to work with you and get this fixed. So if you do, hit them up at securityakamai.com. They have a PGP key on their website if you want to you know, make sure that you're talking to the right people and your communication is secure. And they wanted to also uh, let you guys know that they're hiring folks in security as well. And you can see that link right there for that. So thank you all so much. Um, you know, I'm a penetration tester. Mike is. <laughs> thank you.